There's something that no one told me when I started on this path of watercolor that I'm going to tell you now. Picking paper is kind of really like dating. It's challenging, the unknowns are scary, the variables are infinite, and what works for others may not work for you. Just because your friend is lauding the positives of someone doesn't mean the two of you will find chemistry. Just because I'm into Lara Croft biceps and cheekbones sharp enough to cleave through an army doesn't mean you are. The only way you're going to know for sure is to experiment over and over and over. As singer-songwriter Jake Scott says, love's not only the best days or the worst days, love is the Tuesdays. And by the time you've conquered those Tuesdays and moved past from candlelight dinners with your papers to picking out rings and vacation homes, and everyone is looking at you like you've lost sight of reality, you're already deep, deep down the rabbit hole. Hi, my name is Kathy, and today we're going to do a little dive into two of the most popular brands of watercolor papers, Canson XL and Strathmore 400. Because paper picking, like dating, can be a pain. And we as a species are chronically hopeless and can use any help we can get trying to find the ones that are perfect for our needs. You've seen this blue cover everywhere. They litter the shelves of every craft and art store. They're cemented in the online sphere as one of the most popular brands of art papers, period. When I first dove into the watercolor scene, I genuinely thought Canson XL was the real deal. The shiniest paper in the kingdom, the fairest of them all. I wasn't even aware of Arsh or any of the other cotton papers and what the difference between pulp and cotton was. I simply thought, okay, lots of people are buying this thing. It's super popular. So one plus one means the quality is top notch and I would be remiss if I didn't immediately buy five packs of it. Because that's, you know, definitely how the world works. The official Canson site describes their watercolor XL as being specially designed for wet techniques, including watercolor. It is perfect for students as the paper is very easy to correct and it can be washed with a sponge or a brush. So their emphasis is fully placed on beginners. The paper itself is cold pressed, meaning that there is a slight texture to the surface. The weight is 140 pounds or 300 grams per square meter, which is the standard for most watercolor papers. And it's acid free, meaning that the paper won't deteriorate and change color, at least for a few hundred years. Strathmore 400 I didn't have too much experience with in the beginning because I thought of it as an elite paper and therefore something I can only touch with at least 30 years of experience and a thousand mental breakdowns under my belt. Which thankfully turned out not to be the case. I only needed a healthy dozen breakdowns. The official Strathmore site describes the paper as being popular with watercolorists of all levels because of the fine and even washes that can be achieved using this sheet. It also has a strong surface that will allow lifting and scraping applications. It has the same specifications as Canson, cold pressed, 140 pounds, and acid free. It also comes in more varied forms than Canson, including blocks and bound journals. Okay, first let's do some swatches with both papers. This is a very simple way to acquaint yourself with the paper before you start painting anything. You can get a sense of the texture and the way that the paint and water interacts with the paper in a quick overview. Starting with Canson and starting from top left is just a solid swatch I did with another solid rectangle painted over it. It's pretty smooth and solid, but not 100%. You can see that there are areas where the paint had pooled more and areas around the edges where blooms started to occur. Moving right, the second swatch is a gradation, going from a medium to a very light value, from a thicker mixture of paint to a more watery mixture. And the third swatch is also a gradation, going from red to green. 
Again, we see discrepancies in both. The paint doesn't transition smoothly from one state to the next. There are blooms happening and harsh outlines around the border because the water pushed the paint in that direction. The fourth swatch is where we start to see some positives and proof of Kansen's statement. I did a normal swatch, waited for it to dry, and then scrubbed the paint off with a clean, wet brush. This is called lifting, and it's a common technique utilized in watercolor paintings, creating highlights or softening out the hard edges or lightening an area that turned out too dark. And this paper is perfect for it. It almost looks as though an eraser ran through this rectangle. The final swatch on the bottom right is to gauge how the paint spreads when dropped in water. The annoying thing about this is timing. Pulp paper dries very quickly, so you only have a very tight window of time where you can have the paint flowing, but not flowing so quickly that it's spread across the entirety of the wet area. As you can see, half of it dried and the other half flowed very fast and formed those feathery edges. Moving over to Strathmore, we see a lot of similarities. I ended up with slight blooms for the solid red swatches, but I was able to achieve a smoother gradation with this one than with Canson. Lifting is just as easy, eraser-like once again, and the wet and wet is eh, half serviceable, half a mess, but we'll explore more of that in a later section. If you don't really pay much attention to the varying textural differences of papers and they don't bother you at all, then you can probably skip this part. But if you're like me and engaging staring contests with your papers due to a crippling need to micromanage everything in your life, this information might prove helpful. The textures don't come across super clearly on camera, my camera at least, so this is a bit of a trust me when I say type of deal. Neither of these papers are perfectly smooth, and there are definite grooves and patterns to both. Kansen feels and looks a little rough, but when painted, it looks very smooth. Conversely, Strathmore feels smooth to the touch, but looks more rough when painted. Now, Strathmore is interesting. From afar, it appears to have very little texture, but up close, you can see what looks to be a thousand little spiderwebs branching out. I'm not exaggerating, that's really what they look like. And that texture shows up in the final painting. For lack of a better word, it makes certain colors look a little dirty. Like how when you scoop up water from a stream, you can see bits of gravel and random detritus floating around. It's an odd characteristic that's unique to Strathmore, I found. And at first, I wasn't the biggest fan of it. Now that I'm more used to it, I can kind of see the attraction. Now we're going to do some cool glazing comparisons with rectangles and circles. Here I'm just layering all these colorful shapes on top of each other, and I'm waiting for each layer of paint to dry before applying the next. Glazing produces different tones to mixing. A red stroke overlaid on top of a blue stroke will look different to that of a red that's already been pre-mixed with blue. Here, the differences between the two become a little more obvious. On the left, with Kansen, we have very brightly colored shapes, like candy necklaces. On the right, with Strathmore, we have glazes that look a little bit more neutralized and more intense. This, to me, is a key difference. Kansen produces brighter but weaker colors. Strathmore produces more dull but intense colors. You can also see what I was saying about the textures in the previous section. Strathmore looks so much more grainy than Kansen, whose shapes are as smooth as a zero-edge pool. Now this is the fun part. Granulation. Granulating paints can be found in most watercolor brands. As they mix with water and grab onto the paper fibers, the pigments spread and separate coagulate into clusters, creating textures that are more reminiscent of the surface of rocks and minerals than a painting. It's a stunning effect and can completely change the feel of an artwork when used in right places. And like most watercolor properties, its intensity depends on the paper that you're using. With the top square, I've mixed Potter's Pink and French Ultramarine, 
two granulating panes composed of single pigments. The lumpy rectangle on the right is Strathmore with the same mixture. I abandoned the washi tape for this one because it was a gift and I got sad about using more of the roll. Overall, Canson seems to produce a starker texture than Strathmore. The paints here look really sunk in like small craters embossed onto the paper. On Strathmore, the granulation looks more subdued, which seems to be the running theme for Strathmore. The texture is softer and not quite as pronounced. This is purely an aesthetic preference, and I don't favor one or the other, but if I want to show off to a friend who knows nothing about watercolor, like, hey, this is what the medium is all about, and I'm going for full shock and awe, I probably choose the Canson granulation. Canson and Strathmore are both 100% pulp papers, and pulp papers are not known for their superb wet and wet capabilities. Now, that doesn't mean that wet and wet is completely impossible, or that you can't achieve pleasing watery effects with these papers. The main difference in my head is that with the lower quality pulp papers, you're sacrificing 80% of your brain power when you're doing wet and wet. As in 80% of your brain power goes into concentrating on getting the timing right because you have such a narrow window where the paper is just wet enough and it can be exhausting. But with papers that are best suited for water, the higher end cotton papers, it feels so much more natural, so much easier because the paper stays wet for a long while. And you notice the difference because you're not doing the constipated turtle pose as you're painting where your shoulders are hunched up to your ears and your nerves are trying to escape the skin. So with these two papers, you have to keep in mind that you're going to get inconsistent results and unexpected effects. With both papers, the paint doesn't move with fluid ease and it's a challenge trying to get the colors to mix evenly on the paper. It's also a pain trying to keep up with the drying. Both papers dry fairly quickly Add to that the summer heat, and you're primed for furious rush and panic. It's near impossible to avoid blooms, or broccolis, you might call them. Like here with Canson, I was trying to go for a striated cloud effect, but it obviously didn't work out. Parts of it ended up blooming, and parts of it dried earlier than the rest, and resulted in these hard edges. I tried the same with Strathmore, with similar results. Trying to achieve an even gradation with Canson and Strathmore, especially across a large swath of an area, is like wrangling a bear from its hibernation cave. Difficult is an understatement, and there's only going to be one loser in the end. And guess what? It's not the hairy one. That being said, I did find Strathmore easier to control than Canson because it absorbs water slightly better. With Canson, the paint just floats in a puddle on top of the paper. With Strathmore, the paint still floats on top of the paper, but less so. The difference isn't massive, but it's enough for me to feel a bit more relaxed attempting any kind of wet and wet with Strathmore. It's best to just accept the unpredictability the blooms and hard edges for what they are, because there is a massive charm to them. They're the trademark aesthetics of water media and can only be found in water media, so why not embrace them for what they are? With some cotton papers, you have to work to produce blooms, and they won't turn out half as clean as these. The blooms here are sharp and aesthetically nice. And if you don't want those effects or the hassle, you can just do wet on dry. Now I'm going to do two example paintings and let you see how the papers compare with an identical subject. First, some apples. Nutritious, nice and simple. Kind of. <laughs> Turns out apples are more difficult to paint than they seem. For the left apple, I'm painting wet onto dry, so I'm applying wet paint onto dry paper and waiting for that layer to fully dry before applying the next one. Again, just to see the general effects of glazing 
and how well the paper can withstand multiple layers. With the right apple, I'm using mostly wet and wet techniques. I apply the first layer, and while it's still wet, I load my brush with another pigment and apply it to the painting. So I'm moving the pigments around with the brush, allowing them to mix directly on the paper. And now we're on to the second subject, trees. Right, full disclaimer, this Kansan tree is struggling. Not because of the paper, but because I don't paint enough trees. And so naturally I thought it would be a good idea to paint a few for a quasi-professional, but not really, comparison video. So again, they're far from being perfect copies of each other. And that's a me issue, not a paper issue.
Tenzin Excel isn't the best paper that exists out there. Honestly, it's not even the best pulp paper that's out there. If tomorrow I broke into a lab and spent weeks stripping apart the scientific properties of Kansen, holding it up to the juggernauts of the paper industry, I've no doubt its qualities in comparison will amount to a very short list, scraping the bottom of the barrel. Wet and wet is unpredictable and wild, and the colors lack depth and fade even more with time. I mean, a night sky painting will fade to a daytime painting in about half a year. That is not ideal. Yeah, that uh, sounds like a real winner, Kathy. So I should never buy it, right? Well, no. Because it might be the best paper for you. You who have just started out on watercolor. You who just want something accessible. Because if I reach into my hat box of very professional, artist sounding words, I'll pull out two notes, pretty and forgiving. It's hard to produce mud with Kansen, so much so that you actively have to try, and extremely easy to produce bright, pretty colors, so much so that you have to keep reminding yourself to neutralize, otherwise it'll look as though a candy wave vomited all over your page. And that, in my experience, is a hefty shield against beginner's discouragement. Because you know that no matter how much you overwork the paper, the end product will still have a vibrancy to it. It's still going to look somewhat nice. And ignoring techniques and all that, at the end of the day, all we want is to make something that we can look at and say, huh, I really like how this color blob interacts with this other color blob and how together they form a giant blob that doesn't burn my retinas. Our brain doesn't ask for much. If you're not planning on doing a lot of wet and wet, Kansen is a decent starter paper, especially considering its price point. A 9 by 12 inches paper pad with 30 pages costs 17 Canadian dollars at Michael's, so around 57 cents per paper. That's really affordable. You can practice your brush strokes and values and color mixing to your heart's content without worrying whether every mistake is going to drain your bank account. And you need that kind of paper in your arsenal. With paper you can always back into. A notebook in your desk drawer or your bag that you can flip open when you just feel the need to paint without pressure. Peace of mind is a commodity that's tough to scrounge. And Kansen is the smiling kid behind a rickety homemade stall selling it for a few quarters. You know what you're getting, and it's not pretending to be more than what it is. I like to think of Strathmore as a more mature, older sibling of Kansen. Similar DNA, but just a little more proficient at life. Trading the pretty shallowness for reliability and depth. More intensity, better control. It holds up to multiple washes, lifts very well, and its paintings have a dimension that Kansen paintings lack. Working with it, you don't quite feel as though the paper is conspiring to counter your every move. Those are all great reasons for a purchase. And I'm pausing here because, yep, there is a but coming. Strathmore is pretty neat, but I hesitate to recommend it wholeheartedly, and it has to do with its pricing. A 9 by 12 paper pad with 12 pages Cost 17 Canadian dollars at Michael's, so around $1.42 per paper. This is where Strathmore loses me in the crowd. Personally, I find a price tag high for what it offers, considering the near triple jump from 57 cents per paper to $1.42 per paper. I would expect Strathmore to be a huge improvement on Kansen, a pulp paper that is much closer to the abilities of cotton than its cheaper sibling. As it stands, however, the improvements aren't jaw-dropping or noticeable enough for me to run out into the streets proclaiming it to be the next paper miracle. And the way it sells itself, I have to raise my brows a little and be like, who do you think you are? Because there are other pulp papers out in the market sitting at a similar price point, and one particular brand that is very close to being cotton, that just perform better and with more character. Taking the price into account, I think the paper is perfectly fine. I like it. It's dependable and solid. 
but dependable doesn't raise my heart rate beyond the steady amble. And Strathmore is like the guy with the guitar perched artfully in some ledge singing Wonderwall because that's his only personality trait. He's a plain bread in nice clothes, and there's at least a dozen more of him waiting around the corner. But in the end, these are just my opinions. Sharp cheekbones, remember? You might have a completely different experience with the papers, and you might go from a love to hate or a hate to love as you journey forth with them. Who knows, next year I might actually proclaim Strathmore to be the next paper Jesus. So experiment. Go have those candlelight dinners and tearful breakups. That's half the battle, but also half the fun.